I was reminded after we finished that prayer time, Hashem reminded me of a principle in Judaism brought down by our sages and other great men that when you pray for others who need a similar thing, whatever that happens to be, that you are answered first. And the, and the principle being that, that you're like, um, they're like the garden, you're like the water hose, and Hashem is the spigot. When you attach the garden hose to the spigot and you bring the hose to the garden, you turn the water on, the hose gets watered first. Now, having said that, we're not supposed to interpret that to mean that we pray selfishly for people, that we pray for people only because we want to be watered first. That's not really the incentive. That's not the point. But the point is that when we do pray for them to receive breakthrough in this case, then Hashem is going to give us breakthrough first. That's just the way it works. When our focus is on them and our focus is on watering the garden, then Hashem says, I'm going to water you first. And I admit that praying for the people that have breakthrough is especially the ones who were the HCOs who want to move here and need to move here and believe in God to move here. And there's various obstacles in their way, this, that, or the other, jobs, houses need to be sell, sold, <coughs> relationship issues, family issues, whatever those are. Uh, there's other issues as well. I don't have the answer, but I, I, I'm praying for them selfishly because, as I've said multiple times, they need us. They're, they're wanting to move here because they need, they need this community. The truth of the matter is we need them just as much as they need us. We need, their, we need their synergy. We need their energy. We need their gifting. We need their skill. We need their insight. We need their ability to draw others. We need those who have young children. We need their children. Those who have teenagers, we need their teenagers. And so we need, we need them as much as they need us. And so I just said to myself, self, we've been waiting all this time for this to, to happen and people to come here. And we're always going to have HCOs. Hashem is going to continue to grow that. We have a new HCO in France. I mean, come on. So we're always going to have that. But Hashem is going to bring more and more and more. And now is the time. Because we don't have time. we got a lot to do. We don't have time to wait for a, a year or two or three down the road for something to finally happen. And just like I, I love what, uh, what Yosef said. He, he was quoting that, that passage or that statement that was taught to me so many years ago by my friend Avi, that, um, that Hashem, Yeshua to Ke'erf Ein, he saves in the blink of an eye. And salvation refers to everything. And that is how it works. I mean, I can go back and look at my life. You know, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Do you mind if I tell you a quick story? This reminded me of when, when, the, when the shofar fell over. It reminded me of this story. So maybe Hisham wanted me to share the story. That's why it fell over. And uh, when it fell over, I could see the concern on your face, Joseph, and I thought to myself, don't worry about it. That shofar has been through a lot. <laughs> but here's the thing. It's like, Yeshua toke erif ein. So one, on one of our trips to Israel... I decided to take this so far, which I will never do again, but that's not because of anything negative about the trip, just about what I'm about to tell you. So we took the trip to Israel, and coming back, we had a lot of flight issues, it delays, bumping, and all kind of stuff. And so we ended up, in order just to get home in time for the Shabbat, we flew from wherever we were, I forget where we were, to Oklahoma City in the middle of the night and rented a car and drove here. And we basically got here in time for the Shabbat service. Well, the bag, the, the velvet bag for this shofar is a very dark blue. And what had happened, the shofar had rolled to the back of the trunk. So when I took everything out of the vehicle, I took the car back to the, to the place that we rented it from over at the airport, the shofar was still there. I didn't notice it until the next day or the day after because we were so exhausted. And this shofar means a lot to me. There's a big story behind it, which I won't go into it right now, but it's very, very special. It's, it's very unique, and it's, you couldn't replace it. So we went to the airport in desperation, and they didn't have it. And I said, where's the car? They said, we've already rented it. It's, already, it's, 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 it's out. It won't be back till whatever. And so long story short, they promised to call us when the car came back, and they did. And we went there, 
And this car had traveled whatever, wherever it had traveled, and people put luggage in and out of the back seat. And still tucked away in the back of the trunk was this shofar. And uh, I said, it shall, it shall never leave this building again. <laughs> again. And so uh, it will never go on a trip with me ever anywhere else. <laughs> so, um, but I just want to say that little story because that, that particular event in our life was very much a miracle. And it reminds me of Yeshua Toka Eref He will save in the blink of an eye. And so we just call out to God and, and believe God for his uh, supernatural protection. Amen. Well, today's message is titled... Adam made me do it. It's catchy title, interesting title, but I can't. I, I, I thought about this title based on a conversation that Zach and uh, Yigal and I had with a pastor a month or two ago, and something he said during the meeting together. Um, a lot of things he said, but this particular thing we're focusing on. We're going to look at the concept of of original sin. And original sin is purported to be rejected by Judaism completely. When you do some study on this, I was not surprised to find that the, 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 con- the, the concept of original sin, as it is traditionally understood, was a construct of Paul, completely Paul, okay? Entirely Paul. It's very interesting. And I have, anyway, I can't wait to get. As I dove into this, however, the topic itself is very complex because there are, and I believe, by the way, this is a one of those mystery things. Like, how can the angels rebel if they don't have free will? We don't really know, but we know that they did. So this particular topic is very complex, and I, I, I believe I can imagine that for most people, it's going to take a little bit getting used to because you've been mentally conditioned to believe a particular thing. And I'm going to suggest that maybe what you've been taught is not exactly true, which I I do that rarely. But today I'm going to really, really do that. I'm going to suggest to you, at least in a way, just stick stick with me on this for a moment. This, This is one of those topics where it's kind of yes, no, maybe. But I'm going to suggest to you that Yeshua was not the second Adam. There is no second Adam. Do you know that the concept of the second Adam comes from Paul? Do you know it's not mentioned in the Gospels? Do you know what Paul didn't also did not mention? Kepha did, allegedly, if we believe the book of Acts anyway. But at least Kepha is credited with this. Paul's not. Paul did not mention, did not ever talk about the Messiah being the one who came like Moses. He mentioned Adam, but not Moses. You're going to learn today why. It was tactful. It was a tactic of Paul to make sure that Yeshua was the second Adam, but not the second Moses. We'll find out why. Now, <clears throat> Adam made me do it. This is a very interesting statement because as people understand original sin, I understand that in the Christian mind, everything goes back to this. I'm incapable of following the Torah. I'm a sinner in desperate need of salvation. I'm, in, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm not able to do anything of my own accord to be saved because Adam made me do it, okay? Now, Judaism completely rejects this, and we're going to get into this. It's going to be a little cerebral. I'm going to try to keep it lively and not too boring, but it's a little cerebral, but we're going to get into this. Judaism rejects this idea that uh, the idea of original sin. What does original sin teach exactly? Original sin teaches that Adam sinned, And all those who are born by him, which would be the entire human race, are infested with sin at the outset. And as a result, we're all condemned. We're just we're just sinners in need of a savior. We're just automatically condemned. Nothing we can do about it. 
And Paul's idea of original sin taught that the Torah only served to exasperate that fact that we're such sinners that when the Torah was given, it only proved to us how bad we really were and therefore how much we needed a Savior that we couldn't do it on our own. And it taught us how great our sin was. So actually, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I'll probably end up repeating myself this statement. But actually, in Paul's economy, the Torah was just as culpable to the fall of man as the serpent. Which is why he called the Torah the law of sin and death. Because it, too, brought death into the world. According to Paul, it exasperated that death and highlighted highlighted the need for Messiah. So Paul taught that through the sins of one man, death came into the world. And through the, through the righteousness of one man, life came into the world. So it focused all of our attention on the fact that we are, we are not able to do anything for ourselves. Judaism rejects that. Judaism rejects the idea that you're born a sinner, that you're born a derelict, you're born worthless. And if you think about the Christian message, it is very much a depressed message. It is very much a depressed message. You know, pardon me for bringing up, a, you know, before I get any further, let me say a blessing here because I'm, 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 I'm going to get carried away. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and has commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Adonai, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouth and the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us, know your name, study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Adonai, who teaches Torah to his people Israel. Amen. So what I was going to say was pardon me for bringing up a Marine Corps boot camp analogy. This is probably true in other services, basic trainings, but I can only speak for the one I went through. When you get to Marine Corps boot camp and uh, they, they, they treat you like they can't believe that the recruiter recruited you, that you are so pathetically worthless. They, they, they look at you with utter disgust. In fact, our first day or two, the drill instructor pretended like it, this wasn't even our actual drill. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We have another preliminary drill instructor just to kind of take us through our first week of in dock or whatever. And he just was... Tr- pretended like he was going to give us a, a drill lesson. And he said, you know what, it's just, y'all just mob, mob to the left, mob to the right. He just acted like we were so worthless and so pathetic. They constantly told us, you're never going to make it. They constantly told us, you will never be Marines. In fact, in the Marine Corps, which is a little different, I think, than other branches. I may be wrong, and you, you guys who served in other branches, or gals who served in other branches can tell me differently. But in the Marine Corps, they don't even refer to you as a, they refer to you as a recruit. And they speak to you, and you're, you're only allowed to speak about yourself in the third person because that's how worthless you are. This recruit, sir, this recruit requests this. That, and and that, that's how they talk to you. That's how you're t- told to talk about yourself. And so at first, uh, the first week of basic and certainly the second week, People are just dropping like flies. I mean, dropping like flies. And they're, because they are overcome with this mentality of, I'm never going to make it. I am not good enough. I cannot do this. I will never be worthy of wearing that uniform or wearing the Eagle Globe and Anchor. And they are dropping like flies. It feels terrible. Okay? But what I came to realize, I had a voice in my head, by the way, and the voice was the voice of my dad. And, and the voice in my ear said something my father said to me about a week before I left for basic training. He, he was in the Navy, but he was, he was on, back then, the Navy's boot camp was separated by a chain link fence from the Marines. So he used to tell me, he said, are you sure you want to join the Marine Corps? Because I used to look over there all the time and thank God every day I wasn't a Marine. 
But he said to me, he said, son, just remember that you're just as good as they are. You're just as good a man as they are. And I took that with me into basic training. And so whenever the, the, the drill instructor was telling me that I was worthless and a piece of garbage, I just heard that voice in my head that said, no, you're not. You're just as good as they are. And it, and it caused me to push through all the hell, okay? But I'm using this analogy because the purpose of the drill instructor telling me that or telling us that was reverse psychology. He wanted to see who would drop out. He wanted to see who would push through. Now, please let me tell you another little story about this because it just exasperates the point. Is that when my parents came for graduation, my mother was with me, and, and my mother is a very sweet person. She's very, you know, like most ladies are, just, you know, motherly. Oh, my God, my son. And there I am in my dress uniform. And so they gave us permission to take our parents around and show them everything. You know, this is what we did. This is where we spent our vacation these last three months. It was beautiful. And um, they said, hey, look, why don't you take your parents to the chow hall? Let them experience, you know, a nice, we'll treat them to a nice dinner. So I was walking my mother to the chow hall, and there was a brand new platoon of brand new recruits, brand new. And there was a drill instructor, and he called them to attention, and he spun around, and he shook my hand and said, congratulations, Marine. Of course, that was very odd for me because these guys are like, you know, deities. And for him to talk to me as a, as a one, as a, as a colleague was crazy, and for I had to get used to referring to him as sergeant, which is very weird for me to say that word. And uh, he said, ma'am, you know, I'm so proud of your son. You should be proud of him too. We're so blah, 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 blah. And she was like, oh, well, thank you. That's so sweet. Uh. And I'm like, yes, you know, roger that. You know, uh, you know, and so he spun around after having, you know, shook my hand and enjoy your lunch. He spun around and he told the platoon, turn around, turn around. Don't even look at him. Don't even gaze at him. You will never be him. You will never wear that uniform. You will never walk down that parade deck. You are going to fail. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. Shut up. Don't even talk to me right now. You're never going to be him. And my mother was going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, oh, my God. And I was, just, I was laughing my head off. I was laughing my head off. That's about what it's like. But see, here's the problem. Here's the problem. In the Christian world, this is what they tell you. They say, you're never going to make it. You're never going to be good enough. You're worthless and a piece of trash. There's nothing you can do to even ever please God, and you need somebody else. It teaches people to be depressed, pathetic people. And there's nobody on the other side saying, yes, you can. There's nobody cheering you on saying, you can do it. You can rise up. This is what keeps people in depression. You wonder why, as Yosef alluded to, the present state of chaos. Do you know why we have so many people out there who are entitled and they have problems and they can't get over themselves? It's this. This is the source. It's not, the, the, the source is not Netflix. The source is not bad movies. The source is not politics. The source is nothing other than what's preached every week on a Sunday, which tells people you're not good enough. But God says you are good enough. The rabbis rejected this and said, no, we, you're not born a sinner. You're not born worthless. You have the power. You have the opportunity to rise up and to elevate. Having said that, it's still true that people die. So on the one hand, we all die. Every human being will die as a result of Adam's sin, and that's true. So every woman is going to have pain in childbirth because of this. Every man is going to have to work by the sweat of their brow because of this. There is depre- there's death and evil in the world because of this. Having said that, we're not born that. We're born with the ability to overcome that, yet we still die as a result. So there's this dichotomy, and I'm going to talk about the rabbi's point of view on this and how it differed substantially from Paul and Paul's alone point of view on this. Now, going back to this conversation that we had with this pastor, he, he said to us that he believed 
and the church generally teaches this, in what he called, quote, the total depravity of man. That mankind, and because he, he couldn't understand what we were trying to tell him where you can keep the Torah and you can be a righteous person. To him, that didn't compute because of this. He believed that man was totally depraved and there's nothing that man could do to not be depraved, save believe in JC. But even then, even if you believe in JC, you still can't keep the law of Moses. So in this flesh, there's, there's, really, no, there's really no freedom. And I just sat there and I was stunned at, at the crazy, depressed nature of that thought. And I, all I could think about was my days in the boot camp. Where I thought, you know, I've, I've had people scream this in my face. But the point of them screaming in my face was so that I would do it. They were actually secretly hoping that I would ignore what they were saying and just push on. Okay? Exactly. Prove them wrong. And so... But this man believed it. He believed, this man believes as a pastor who preaches in the pulpit every Sunday, he believes that he is at the core of his essence totally depraved. And I'm going to suggest to you that's sick. That's a mental illness. To think of yourself that way. And we wonder why self-esteem is such a problem. But if you have people constantly tell you that you're totally depraved, it's kind of like, you know, I don't ever tell you, no one ever tells you, you can do this. You can, you can make this happen. You've, you've got what it takes to make this happen. Anyway, according to the totally depraved mentality, we are born sinners, condemned to death because of the sin of Adam. The law of God only exasperates this condition. It made sin even more sinful Indeed, we came to know what sin really was because of the Torah of God. Thus, as I said, this doctrine makes both the snake and the Torah equally culpable in the fall of man. God's, and of course, to this very day, one one of the, constant battles that I I fight is educating people on the fact that the Torah of God is the Word of God. Because if you said to somebody, the Word of God only makes you a worse sinner, they would naturally think that was nuts. No one would believe that. If I told you, hey, if you you go out and buy a Bible today, it's going to make you a worse sinner. Nobody would believe that. So they're told the law makes you a sinner, but God's word sets you free. You see the deception of the Satan there? Because to them, the law is something apart from the word of God, but not realizing the word of God is the law of God. So it's it's a complete, listen, we have a lot of work to do. That's why we need the help, okay? So this idea of the total depravity of man is, of course, a false idea. Now, what happened with Adam, as we're going to see, is that the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, was, became a part of the essence of the human being. At birth, at birth, the um, Yetzer Hara enters into the human being. And the sages say that, that it has control, to a large extent, until around about the bar bat mitzvah age in which the yetzer tov comes into play. And there's, there's a lot to be said, said about that. We just don't have time to, to broach that topic. But suffice to say that the yetzer hara comes into the human being at the time of birth. Why not before? You see, one of the aspects of that you can see that the idea of original sin is false is because the Yetzir Hara is not in the child in the womb. It's the Yetzir Tov. If it was true that we are sinners born by Adam, then the baby would have the Yetzir Hara in the womb. Well, you might ask yourself, well, Rabbi, how do you know the baby doesn't have the Yetzir Hara in the womb? The answer the rabbis give us is 
because it stays in the womb. The nature of the of Yetzir Hara is to get what it wants, even at its own detriment. And if the baby had the Yetzir Hara, it would want to be out of that confined space, even though it meant its death. It doesn't care. That's why people get addicted to drugs and things and things like that, that they know are bad for them and probably will kill them. They don't care. The Yetzir Hara wants it because all it seeks is pleasure. Now, a lot of Christians would say, they would argue me and say, how can you say that man is not born a sinner? Can't you see the little baby? Look, the little baby doesn't want to share its toys. That doesn't mean it's a sinner. It just means it has a Yetzirah. It just means it has a Yetzirah. So we, but the point, in fact, is, is that Judaism teaches that you have the power through the, through the Spirit of God and through the Word of God to control your Yetzirah. The church tells you you don't have any such power. This is why the church ultimately teaches, this is why Paul ultimately taught to get rid of the law of Moses. Why? Because getting rid of the law of Moses really allows your yet hard to do really whatever it wants to do. Now, let's look at, before we go any further into what the, um, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the story but uh, of the fall of man. We can do that. Most people know the story. But I'm not going to, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to read this story from the, from the Tanakh, or from the Torah, rather. But it's in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, but I want to read to you from the legends of the Jews about the fall of the Satan. Okay, because the question is, does Judaism teach about the fall of the Satan? Of the Satan, the answer, of course, is yes. Okay, it does. It's talked about it in the legends of the Jews. If you have the legends of the Jews, you can look this up later. It's it's in this first volume on page sixty-two, and the article is titled "The Fall of Satan." It says, the extraordinary qualities which Adam was blessed with, physical and spiritual, as well, aroused the envy of the angels. They attempted to consume him with fire, but God protected him by his holy hand. In particular, Satan was jealous of the first man, and his evil thoughts finally led him to his fall. After Adam had been endowed with a soul, God invited all the angels to come and pray and give him reverence and homage. Satan, the greatest of the angels in heaven, he had 12 wings, whereby all the other angels only had six refused to pay and give behest at the behest of God and pay homage to Adam. He said to God, did you not create us angels from the splendor of the Shekinah? And now you want us, you command us to be cast down before the creature which you made from the dust of the earth. And God answered him and said, yet this dust of the ground has more wisdom and understanding than you do, Satan. Satan demanded a trial of wit with Adam and God assented to him and said, I created beasts, birds, and reptiles. I have given them all a name before you and before Adam. If you are able to give them the same names that I've given them, then you will be wise. And if not, then Adam will be the wiser. Okay. So he says, thus God spoke and he betook himself to paradise and Satan followed him. When Adam beheld God, he said, he said to his wife, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Now, Satan attempted to assign names to the animals, and he failed with the first two, presented themselves, the ox and the cow. And God led two others before him, and he, the, the camel and donkey, and he also fell with these as well. God turned to Adam and questioned him regarding the names of the animals, and Adam gave them the proper names, the names that God had assigned to them. Thus, Adam divined the proper name, and Satan was forced to acknowledge the superiority of the first man. Nevertheless, he, Satan, broke out in a wild cry that reached the heavens, and he refused to pay homage to Adam as he had been bidden. The host of angels led by him did likewise in spite of the urgent representation of Michael, who was the first to prostrate himself before Adam in order to show a good example to the other angels. Michael addressed Satan, give adoration to the image of God, but if you do not, then the Lord God will break out in wrath against you. Satan replied, replied, if he breaks out in wrath against me, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, and I will be like the Most High. At once God flung Satan and his host out of heaven down to the earth, and from that moment on, there was enmity between Satan and man. Now, There's another insight here from the Legends of the Jews where it talks about the mitzvah of the woman. So the the woman, Eve, of course, is the one who who partook of the forbidden fruit first. She was the one who was enticed by the Satan. 
that she was the, the, the weaker vessel, and she was the one who enticed Adam to eat. Now, Adam is culpable ultimately because he should have known better. He should have rebuked his wife, and he should have made teshuva on her behalf and so forth, but he failed to do so, okay? But it says here, a woman covers her head to, as a token of Eve's having brought sin into the world. She strives to hide her shame, and women precede men in the funeral and the funeral procession because it was a woman who brought death in the world. And the religious commands addressed to women alone are connected with the history of Eve. Adam was the heave offering of the world, and Eve defiled it. As expatiation, all women are commanded to separate the hala because of what she did to Adam. And because woman extinguished the light of man's soul, she is bidden to kindle the Sabbath lights. So all the things that women do, the three main um, halakot from women, all have to do with rectifying what Eve did. In the eyes of, of, the, of, the, of the rabbis, in other words, that women are not confined to always be daughters of, of Eve where they just have to constantly fall. No, they have the ability, in fact, the responsibility to rise above that and rectify. It's almost like when people, on the one hand, Somebody would say, well, you know, we're totally depraved and we can't, there's no way that we can properly serve God. We just have to depend upon Messiah, Messiah alone, and we're just, we're just wretches. We have nothing to offer. And they'll say that on the one hand. On the other hand, they'll say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Those two statements are contradictory. How can you say, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord, when you're admitting you're a totally depraved person who is incapable of serving God? the Lord. We say, well, we serve the Lord through faith and Messiah, but, but yet you're still admitting you're incapable of doing this over here. It, it's a confused and, and, and actually very depressing point of view. Let's look at the rabbinic view uh, on the sin of, of Adam, because again, there's this issue that we has to be dealt with, the fact that, sin, that death exists. No matter how perfect you are, no matter how perfect you are, no matter how great you keep the Torah, which is possible, you are going to die because of what Adam and Eve did in the garden. So how, what's the answer to that? What's the reason for that? Well, for that, we go to a, some insights I have here from a book called The Sages. And I'm going to first look at a comment by uh, Rabbi Ami, from Shabbat 55 A and B. Let me go to this source here. So it says, in the name of Rabbi Ami, the attempts to ascribe an opinion to the Tanaim is, re is rejected here, and the discussion concludes as thus. From this, it is to be inferred that there is, in fact, death without sin, meaning that there are, are people who are righteous and sinless and yet have died. And there is suffering without iniquity. Indeed, there are people who are righteous, and yet they suffer. And the refutation of Rabbi Ami stands, it says, it seems that Rabbi Ami intended to negate completely the belief in original sin and to restrict the consequences of Adam's transgression just to the fact that death came into the world. For other, so, so the point being here is that one of the explanations given by Rabbi Ami is that death is just a part of life, is a part of the natural order because of Adam. But it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is born a sinner, and therefore that's why you're dying. Now, also it says here that death um, as an outflow of reward and punishment. It says that, Death, per se, is not a punishment for sin, although there was no need for the righteous to experience death, and they deserve to continue living, yet the implementation of the principle of reward and punishment, according to Rabbi Akiva's concept of the relationship between predestination and free will, necessitated imposing death on the righteous as well. 
the Amorim Rabbi Yonanan and Resh Lakish, and likewise Rabbi Shmor Bar Nachmani, differentiated between the death of the righteous and the death of others, following the view of Rabbi Hiya, that the righteous are called living even in their death. So Yeshua affirms this in Matthew chapter 22 and 32, where he says, God, he refers to Abraham, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He said, see, God is the God of the living, not the dead. He refers them as they're alive. So the Christian view is that because of Adam's sin, we're all, we're all dead. We're just dead men, and we're in need of a Savior. But the Jewish view is, no, we're not, because in, in Yeshua even affirmed this and said, no, they're, they're living. They're living. The righteous live, and yet all men die, okay? This is the paradox we have. So also, it goes on to say, in another insight, why was death imposed upon the wicked? Rabbi Yonanon asks. The reason is that as long as the wicked live, they vex the Holy One, blessed be he, as it is written, you have wearied the Lord with your words. But when they die, they no longer vex the Holy One, blessed be he, as Scripture states, there the wicked cease from troubling, Job 3, 17. There the wicked cease vexing the Holy One, blessed be he. Why was death inflicted then upon the righteous? The reason is that as long as the righteous live, they wage war with their inclination. But when they die, they are at rest, as it is written, and there the weary are at rest. We have wearied ourselves enough. Goes on to say that thus death is not a consequence of sin, but is linked to the doctrine of reward and punishment. Rabbi Yonanon, who persisted free will for the individual, regarded the death of the righteous as a type of reward, since it brought an end to their exhausting struggle against their evil inclination. The death of the wicked causes them, in, in this view, to cease facing God, but it actually it implies a punishment since they derive satisfaction from provoking God. So here, death for the wicked is a punishment because they enjoy their, their life of vexing God. And death for the righteous is considered a reward because it relieves us of our constant struggle against the evil inclination. Now, it goes on to another insight here that another Beresha discussed even Moses' death from, sin, from, from his sin the ministering angel said to the Holy One, blessed be he, sovereign of the universe, why did Adam die? Now, this is where we started getting a little closer to um, the, the real issue. of ultimately, Remember, by the way, my purpose in this conversation is why do we need the Messiah? Paul's reasoning of redemption was we need the Messiah because he's the second Adam. Remember what I said in the beginning? Paul likened Yeshua to the second Adam, but nowhere else is that found. He wanted Christ to be the second Adam who would come and not mess up, not eat of the, of the forbidden fruit. Why did he say Adam and not Moses? Because in Paul's economy, Adam was not under the law of Moses. Because the law of Moses and Adam and and, and, Mo, and and Paul's mind came later, and Paul hated the law of Moses. Okay. He wanted to be Adam that had had no nothing but natural moral laws. So he wanted Christ to be the second Adam, but not the second Moses. Okay. He wanted him to come and just make it to where we don't need the law. See, in Paul's mind, the law came only to, ex to prove how wretched we were. So Paul's remedy was to rid the world not just of the sin of Adam, but also of the law of Moses, which would no longer expose us as sinners. To Paul, the Torah was a law of sin and death. Okay? So... It goes on to say, 
The ministering angel said to the Holy One, Blessed be he, sovereign of the world, why did Adam die? He replied, because he did not fulfill my commandments. See, now we're getting closer to the real issue. The issue here is commandment. Adam died because he failed to follow the commandment of God. See, Paul doesn't say that. Paul doesn't even mention that, really. Adam died because he, he, he believed the serpent or whatever. He, he, he failed God, but he doesn't really highlight the fact that he ate something he wasn't supposed to eat. Okay? So it says, he replied, because he did not fulfill my commandments. So they said to him, but Moses did fulfill your commandments. And he answered them, it is my decree, the same for all men, as Scripture says, this is the law when a man dies. Numbers uh, 19, 14. So the point is that death comes to all men, according to the rabbinic view, death comes to all men, but it's not necessarily because we're sinners. Now, the way to understand this, again, please forgive me for using another military analogy, but this, this is just like anybody in, in been in the military or, or any other, not just the military, sometimes this happens on football teams or volleyball teams or whatever. Somebody on the team, somebody in a platoon messes up, everybody does push-ups, right? Isn't that precious? Hadassah told me a funny story about this. She learned this lesson. She said she were in formation, and the drill instructor was going through the ranks, and he was asking them certain questions they needed to know because they're going to be officers in the Navy and or the Marine Corps. And so the drill instructor was going through, and he was asking this one young man to, to describe to him what the rank of Master Gunnery Sergeant looks like in the Marine Corps. And the young man said, Sir, the master gunnery sergeant rank is three stripes up, four rockers down, and a pineapple in the middle. And the drone sergeant said, pineapple, pineapple. You think a Marine would have a pineapple on his insignia? It's a bursting bomb. It's a bursting bomb. And Hadassah told us a story when she came home on vacation and she said, we're all staying in formation. And, and Hadassah said, I said to myself, hmm. and of course she said, what did the drone start to do? Well, he said, for that, everybody's going to run. And so we just ran for miles and miles and miles because this guy said something about a pineapple on a master gunnery sergeant in, insignia. Nobody else said anything about a pineapple. If you'd have asked Hadassah, she would have said, it's a bursting bomb. But guess what? She still had to run. Because it's part of the team. This is also a very important mindset. Again, this, this takes a lot of cerebral activity going on up here, which is not people are, in the religious world are not accustomed to. But this is why Yeshua had to come and make a macro sacrifice. This is why it's not for the individual. Because maybe you didn't call it a bursting bomb or, or pineapple. But yet you still have to have the renewed covenant. You've been doing it. The Levites did it great. Let's, that's a good example. Did, did the Levites participate in the golden calf? No. How come they had to suffer in the wilderness? They're not, they weren't sinners. They didn't, they didn't. The women didn't give their gold. Most women wouldn't. Honey, give me your necklace. I'm going to make a golden calf out of it. You lost your ever loving mind. <laughs> Dinner will be ready in 30 minutes. You're going to take a mic. You better get away from my jewelry box. So the women didn't participate in the golden calf. Then why did they have to suffer? According to Paul, they're all just worthless, but it's not true. Okay? It's not true. Now, one more, in, one more insight here about this particular uh, topic. Um, the, it says here, Adam, and says, oh, excuse me, not Adam, pardon me. It says, and yet though... The angels are talking to God and says, you did not take away from man the evil heart that your law might bring forth fruit in them. For the first Adam clothed himself with the evil heart, transgressed and was overcome. And likewise also all were born of him. So in other words, this insight is, is t saying to us that with Adam, the problem with Adam, with Adam did not come innate sin. 
You're not born a sinner automatically condemned out of the womb. That's not true. Because, see, again, you have to think things through. On the con- contradictorily, most Christians would say, well, a baby that dies is not going to go to hell because it's sinless. Really? When, so when do they become accountable? Well, you know, and I don't know what Christians would say. I don't have no idea what they would say the age of accountability is. But in, in Judaism, it's a 12 for a girl and 13 for a boy. That's when you're, you're that's when you become, a, so think about the grace of Judaism. The grace of Judaism is you become accountable, let's just say 13, as a, as a man, as a yeah, young man. You become accountable at 13, but according to Jewish law, you're not eligible for any type of punishment until you're 21, until you're 20. 20. There's a seven-year grace period between accountability and actually being eligible for punishment. That's why when people say, well, you just, well, golly. What, what, Goober? What are you trying to say? Well, golly, Rabbi, you're trying to take us back to the old days when we just sacrifice our kids or we just stone them when they talk bad to us. Well, Goober, do you think that back in the olden days we were just stoning our little eight-year-olds? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think so. Truth be told, that's not... <laughs> The truth of told is they're not even accountable for their sin until they're 13, and you wouldn't even think about stoning them until they were 20. Although there's been times we want to stone our kids other than that, but you're not allowed to do it until they're 20. So you're not born a sinner. You're welcome. You're not born a pathetic wretch. You're not born totally depraved. You're welcome, okay? You're born, yes, with a yet or hard that we have to fight against. We're born, yes, with free will, the opportunity to choose to be good. See, all those people that dropped out of that platoon could have made it. This was stopping them. This was stopping them. So that and that's that's the issue, right? So going going moving on from here, let's go, let's get to the crux of the problem. Now I find this extraordinarily fascinating. So when you look at things, as I said before, Paul made Christ the second Adam, but he never mentioned Messiah being the second Moses. Why? Well, Zach and Yigal, the reason is, is because Paul didn't want the Torah again. See, Moses brought Torah. And if you're going to have a second Moses, then you're going to have a renewed Torah. Paul didn't want that. Paul changed the definition of the new covenant. You know, it, it's so ingrained in people to hate Judaism that I had somebody comment this week. This is a particular person who comments a lot on the channel and you know, they're just, they're usually against everything we say and they're constantly commenting. And, you know, we interact a little bit sometimes. So this person went back and found one of my old shorts where Rebecca and I were in Jerusalem. I was standing in the, in the plaza of the hotel and I was talking about that when we pray, our prayers come to Jerusalem and go up from Jerusalem. Okay. This person said, that's not true. That is not true. Our prayers don't bounce around all the play, all over the place and then go to one location and go up. Our prayers, when we say them, go right to God. And I wrote to this person, I said, do you think that Jerusalem is special? And the person wrote back, understand, big Christian, wrote back and said, it's no more special than any other place in the Holy Land. I replied back and I said, do you realize that in the Tanakh, the specialness of Judaism, or Jerusalem, excuse me, is mentioned 800, 800 times in different verses. God talks about the unique nature of Jerusalem 800 times in various verses. But see, this person, what I see in this person is just an outgrowth of the ministry of Paul a disdain, a hatred for the things of God, a hatred. Look, listen to when you, when you talk to Christians today and they talk about the law of Moses, notice the, the disdain and the hatred and the gritted teeth. 
which they talk about it. They don't talk about other things. They don't talk about all the, the garbage shows on Netflix like that, but they'll talk about the law of Moses like that. Think about it. I'm not, I'm not against Netflix. I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm just using that as an example, okay? They talk about that kind of stuff. Now, let's go to the real problem, okay? Forget Paul. He's a nut, he's a nut bag. Let's go to the real problem. The real problem, the reason we need Yeshua really is not because of Adam. You know why? Because we've already, we had already rectified Adam's situation. And then we blew it. By the way, there's an article on Aish called Akidak of Isaac. And um, there, anyway, I have it saved here. Let me see if I'm going to give you the title or the author rather. Um, but you can look this up because he talks about, uh, he talks about Abraham bringing Isaac to be offered because he felt like Isaac was going to overturn the sin of Adam. And bring, and, and bring him, not the, the sin of Adam, meaning bring back the restoration of God again. Not that men are born sinners, but rather to get rid of this death so we can go back to what it's supposed to be before there was a, a problem with the forbidden fruit. The rabbi who wrote it was Rabbi Noson, N-O-S-O-N, Noson Weiss, W-E-I-S-Z, W-E-I-S-Z. It's called Thoughts from the Humash, Themes Number 6, The Binding of Isaac. So you can look at that and see what he says. It's a fascinating article. I have it saved here, and I have all kinds of notes, commentary to it. But what happened with the golden, or the golden calf situation? So we're, so we're in Egypt, and we have this very unique experience called the Pesach. Very unique. Never again repeated. Can't be repeated. All the other Pesachs we have are only a memorial of that event. Okay? We come out. We go through the water. We're cleansed. We come to the foot of Mount Sinai, and the sages say, when you look at the ancient material, it says that we are born again. We have supernatural weapons of warfare. I'm holding a battle axe. You know it. And there is no sick. There is no blind. There is no deaf. There is no barren women. In fact, it says that even the angel of death has no authority over us whatsoever. We are, I mean, we're just, it's, it's, it's glorious. All we lack is to take hold of the Torah, and then we would walk right into the Messianic era. That's all that, that we lacked. The second Adam was Israel. The second Adam was Israel. Because Adam, all he had to do was not eat of the forbidden fruit and go eat of the tree of life, and he would have lived forever as a righteous being. All we had to do was eat of the fruit of the tree of life, the holy Torah. But the serpent showed up again, and he enticed us to worship the golden calf. And when we worship the golden calf, we were that second Adam that ate of that forbidden fruit, and we blew it again. We blew it. And guess what? Death entered the world again, and all the other curses. We lost our weapons of warfare. We lost all of our ornaments. It says that we had crowns on our head. We lost our crowns. Just like Adam, we were the second Adam. And it makes perfect sense. Because Adam was a human being, and a human being had to overdo what a human being did, but we blew it. Not because we couldn't help it. Had nothing to do with the Torah. The Torah was yea upon the mountain, and we were down there worshiping the golden calf. The sages talk about this, and it says here that it says, in one of the sources in which the dictum is decided, is cited, the homilist proceeds to interpret it by drawing a parallel between the actions of Israel and that of Adam. He concludes with the teaching of Rabbi Yose mentioned above. When Israel declared all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will obey the Holy One, blessed be he, said, I gave Adam one commandment to fulfill and I compared it to the ministering angels. 
As it says, behold, the man has become like one of us, Genesis 3.22. These Israelites who perform and observe all 613 commandments, apart from general rules, the detailed regulations, and the minutia, they are therefore entitled to everlasting life. But when they said, this is thy God, O Israel, death came upon them, said the Holy One, blessed be he. You, and he says, it says here, you have walked in the footsteps of Adam. Remember what we taught about Ezekiel 18. A man is accounted for his own sin unless he follows in the footsteps of his father, in which case his father's sin is accredited to him as well. So the minute that we did what our father Adam did, we received the same curse again. Okay? So it says, you follow in the footsteps of Adam, nevertheless, you shall die like men. You, 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 you shall die like men. Okay? So it goes on to say that Rabbi Yose said, the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Don't read engraved, but write, read charut, uh, 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 charut, excuse me, freedom. What is this freedom? Rabbi Yose said, inscribed on the tablets, he's talking about the original ones, inscribed on those tablets was freedom from death. If we had received those tablets from Moses without sending the golden calf, we would have been set free from the sin of Adam, and we would have entered into the messianic reign, and the, the world would have been brought to glory. Okay? Everything would have been overturned. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, the real problem, I'm almost done here. I'm almost done. Okay? The real problem here is not the sin of Adam. The real problem was the sin of the golden calf. Because we failed. But here's the problem. Now that we're, the reason that Moses couldn't go back into heaven and get a brand new set of tablets and bring them down, we had, he had to get some ones carved out of some stone, is because we couldn't go back to Egypt and redo that whole thing. You can't enter back into the womb and be, you, you, what are you going to do? What do we do? So we got a renewed covenant. Great. It's the same content, different substance. But guess what? Death still reigns. In, in Paul's depravity, he made the Torah the problem. He made the law of Moses the problem. That's the enemy. And as a result, from him was birthed this false religion whereby everybody in it hates the law of God. And nobody wants to follow it. And in fact, they do the exact, exact opposite of it. And if you dare insinuate that they have the power to keep it, they laugh at you and mock you and call you a cult leader and a synagogue of Satan member. Just for telling them that they can do it. You can climb the rope, I promise. But nobody has tried to climb the rope, and therefore they've just been told they can't do it. They've never tried it. So the, the problem, it says, with the doctrine of Paul, he, he wished to get, he had enmity against the law of Moses. He wished to get rid of the law of Moses in its entirety. He wanted to take away the law of Moses, which is why he made Messiah the second Adam and not the second Moses. Peter, Peter in the book of Acts, in his sermon, referred to Messiah as the second Moses. Why? Because that's the real problem. That's why he was the atoning offering. He had to come and he had to redo the whole Egypt thing so that we could get those seconds, that first, excuse me, the first set of tablets again. This is why throughout everything we do in Judaism, if you'll notice, every time we do anything, we lift up the cup for Kiddush on Friday night, we lift, we do lift up the challah, we do anything, we're always told this is a remembrance of the memorial from e, the Exodus from Egypt. Are we not? Egypt is mentioned over and over and over and over and over again. Why? Because that's where we really blew it. That's why we need the Messiah. We need the Messiah to come and bring us back 
to that original lamb so that we can come back to that mountaintop to receive those holy tablets again. We, and we can this time eat of the tree of life and we can live by the tree of life. Maybe so in our lifetime. Amen, amen, amen.